you're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Land. This podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Tiffany Cruikshank and Katya Bach, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. Hello, Diane. Welcome back to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. Thank you so much for giving us the benefit of your time once again. Thank you, Rachel. It's so, I'm really glad to be here. This is going to be a fun one, I think. And I wanted to start with a little bit of background about why this topic in particular came up. Um, And I think when we talk about purpose or intention, most of us have a, a sort of general or instinctive understanding of what it is and why it's important. In yoga, I might ask different students to do exactly the same pose or practice, but for different reasons and and hoping for different outcomes. And in wider society, we know in the legal world that mens rea, the intent, the criminal intent is necessary to, to differentiate some crimes from other crimes. And I even found a quote that I loved here from Oliver Wendell Holmes, even a dog knows the difference between being kicked and being tripped over. So it's obvious, I think, in, in the general understanding that intention is important and it can have an impact on outcomes, especially when it comes to things like mindfulness practices, including yoga. So I'm really excited today to pick your brain from the perspective of somebody who knows a lot more than I do about the brain and the mind and psychology and, and how people work and how people think. Oh, well, thanks, Rachel. I'm I'm excited to dive in (laughs) with this topic as both a yogi and as a scientist. Yeah, perfect. And I do want to pick both of those brains too, because I think we can't talk about intention without thinking about how potent that is in yoga practice. So I thought we might start with a definition. And I found some general definitions online of intention as being a determination to act in a particular way, an aim or a plan. And then for purpose, the reason for which something is done or created or the reason for which something exists, a person's sense of resolve or determination. So my first question for you is, does that definition kind of tally up with your understanding of intention and purpose from a psychology perspective, from a research perspective? Absolutely. Like intention has been studied for a bit of time now and and looking at it, um, in terms of volition, meaning like the intent to act in a certain way, um, as well as looking at it in terms of purpose, like you mentioned. So when we attend to understanding people's intrinsic motivation or their motivation for doing things because they want to do them for the sake of doing them versus feeling like they need an incentive to do them, we see that purpose, goal setting, intentions do have a contributing value to all of those different pursuits and actually contribute to behavior and reflection upon the behaviors that are performed. Mm. So there's, there's a sort of sense of intention being an internal motivator that's different from what we might have as extrinsic or external motivators, you know, status or money or other people's expectations. It can be because oftentimes when people are setting an intention, let's say a mental intention for something, oftentimes it's something that they are, it's a goal. It's something that they're trying to bring more of into their lives. Um, and so the, the next thing is though, is that there's, there's a lapse between like having that want, that desire for something and also oftentimes being able to engage in the behaviors to execute it or to know mm. what behaviors are to execute it. Mm. There's that level of it, but then there's also the level of it when we look at motor movement, right? Where there's actually, um, some evidence from the neuroscience that suggests that there's a level of, 
uh, conditioning that happens prior to movement. And so it's actually a conditioned uh, response that feels that we reflect upon as thinking it's an intention maybe to like reach our arm up to the sky or something like that, but that it's actually something that's been conditioned and primed prior to the movement. But more recent research is, is looking at it a little bit differently and saying that, you know, there, there is this free will that we can set an intention that also will influence action. Mm. And so there's a lot of different ways to look at it. But yeah, the, the science and different aspects of psychological science look at it in different respects as well. Mm. Do we know, I guess, do you know, because I don't, which parts of the brain are involved in intention setting? Do we have a sense of that? Well, we anything cognitive um, and, and verbal is going to be more prefrontal cortex um, in terms of, of that. And, and when we look at the entire um, cerebral cortex, that's also where we see the initiation of motor movement and things mm -hmm. like that. So there's a communication along the outer layer of the brain, the cortex of the brain that is responsible for that type of intention. Now, if we look at it in terms of it being more or mental or cognitive, what we think is happening is that it's happening at the level of the prefrontal cortex and some associated structures, but that we then create what's called a pattern recognition system. So when we set something in our mind, and especially if we repeat it over and over, that starts to create a neural pattern. And the concept is that when we prime the brain with this level of pattern recognition or neural priming, we're likely to engage with, act in ways, or see in the world the very thing that we're intending. So, I mean, this kind of sounds like manifesting. Kind it of. is, but scientifically, it's like what we're learning is that the brain is really a detector. Yeah. So what, what we're figuring out is, so we know about fight or flight, right? So we know that like the amygdala, the limbic system is like detecting danger, right? Or mm -hmm. possible threat, right? And then we're also starting to learn that the higher order processing areas of the brain are also detectors, but in different ways so that we can actually engage in focusing practices first by maybe setting the goal or the intention or the purpose, right? Mm. So we kind of plant the seed. And again, if we repeat something over and over, and if we add even like a physiological um, mind body, so not just repeating the thought, and making it cognitive, but trying to feel accomplishment of it. So like an embodied cognition. And again, mm -hmm. this is also part of the, the psychological neuroscience aspect of it. So the more that we can get into like this state of maybe intention realization, that, that when we do that, this concept of manifesting, that sounds like a law of attraction or something spiritual in a scientific way opens your sensory receptors to see what is already there because yeah. there's way too much stimuli. <laughs> that's so exactly right what I was thinking. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. It sounds really woo woo. And there were definitely some uh, research papers that I had to look at to prepare for this that I was like, what the hell? That's taking me way down a rabbit hole. But the reality is there's so much stimulus that we're exposed to on a daily basis. So much sight, sound, subliminal messaging, feelings. There's no way the brain can consciously comprehend every single one of them. And yet it's it's taking it all in and filtering, deciding which bits it shows us, which bits it makes us consciously aware of. So when you really break it down, it does make sense that we would have the capacity to say, be on the lookout for this thing. And mm -hmm. I know I've experienced this when I've been shopping for a car, you know, maybe I'll get a, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about like a red Suzuki Swift. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they're everywhere. I see them on the road uh -huh. everywhere I go. And it, it's not that there are suddenly more, I've just primed my brain to see them. Pattern recognition. Yeah, it's exactly. It's, 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 it's all of that. It's, it's anything and it can happen in negative ways as well, right? Yeah. Can, in any way, in neutral ways, positive ways, whatever it may be. So that's the thing is like understanding that our five senses are really taking in this billion bits of, of information. And what we call it in the science world is noise to sound signal ratio, meaning right. that 
it's too noisy and we wouldn't want to process all that information yeah. that we take in and we'd be in a state of confusion. Yeah. So basically so that's the, happening anyway. That's happening unconsciously. It can yeah. happen negatively, but we can create that. We can prime ourselves for better pattern recognition for the kinds of patterns that we want to be able to recognize. Is, is that what research suggests? We can. And then the gap sometimes is between and now executing behavior. Okay. And that's where I think intention and some of this other research comes in because we're not really sure what makes us go into motion. Mm. So we talked a little in the, in the previous, well, we didn't, but on the podcast we did about placebo and nocebo. And to me, that's also a kind of suggestion of the power that the brain has, the power of suggestion, the power of belief, and even the power of intention. Because when you think about studies that are double blind, it means that it's also important that whoever's giving the treatment doesn't know that they're giving the treatment because if they did, there's a suggestion that that could change the outcome. Um, so what does research kind of tell us? And we, we found a bit, you um, suggested some papers. I found a couple of papers. I had some suggested by Valerie Nopik, who teaches with you on the mental health and wellness training. And even my mum, who is currently studying positive psychology, sent through some research. So I, I, I did some really deep diving, but a lot of it didn't make much sense to me. So I'm hoping you can pull out some, some key takeaways for our listeners. What does research tell us about the potential for intention to change outcomes when it comes to our yoga practice or healing or, or I guess movement's a bit more complicated, isn't it? They're still debating that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, we have a lot of documented studies on like, like you mentioned in the podcast that um, you hosted with yoga medicine on both placebo and nocebo. And so, so it is true. There is power of the mind in terms of how we perceive pain or effectiveness of an intervention and things like that. And then even in other uh, literature, kind of beyond some of that, but in, in, in the world of expectations, like we know that like if caregivers have certain perceptions, expectations of their children, that the children will live up to that expectation for better or for worse, mm -hmm. you know, even beyond like internal characteristics, like intelligence, they would behave in ways that would meet the expectations. So there's a lot of power and like belief in what the mind can set, but the power in terms of, of, of thinking about therapeutic intention is that we have to remember too, that we are social beings and that we do have a social engagement system that is part of our nervous system. And it does soothe us. And it is something that we read information um, about each other in terms of, again, in these like non-conscious ways, most mm -hmm. of the time. But the idea is that, um, you know, when we have a belief and especially if we have others supporting that belief, Oftentimes we can find that there is a reduction in certain symptoms and certain nervous system symptoms that will provide a sense of relief. There are, of course, thousands of anecdotal uh, mm. stories of people who've had miraculous healing, and there's probably thousands of millions of anecdotal stories where people didn't hear, heal and they believed, yeah. but we don't research that. Yeah. So- and they're not as I fun stories say, to talk about either. So yeah, they're not as exciting that this person, you know, really had the intention and did their meditating and they wanted they to heal, heal and they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> that know? one's not going to show up on Upworthy, is it? Yeah. So, uh, so I think that realistically though, um, I think that the power is within the individual and how well they hone that ability. Because I think if yes. you're living a very distracted life, I think if you're not like working on focus and attention and on your mental capacity to tap into optimal states of consciousness, then we are less likely to have a strong impact on mm. results in terms of our mind body connection. You've pulled out a couple of things there that I think are really important to talk about. One is intention alone 
is definitely not enough. Mm. Not even enough when it comes to setting a goal in our lives. We can't just decide to become president and assume okay. that it will happen. There have to be action steps along the way. And it's true in, in a therapeutic setting as well. We can't just think ourselves well. Intention isn't a replacement for education and intelligent action and you know medical treatments in, in that context. So intention has, I think, definite power, but it's not a replacement for action. It's not enough. It's not the only thing. And I think that's really important to talk about whenever we talk about the power of the mind is to also talk about some other things having power as well, like our environment and, mm -hmm. you know, pathologies. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one thing that I wanted to draw out from that. And the other thing is the power of practice that if we're hoping to hone our intentions and have them influence outcomes, practice definitely seems to help. And I found some work along those lines. One is an, an old one from Dean Shapiro from 1992, where he was talking that as meditators continue to meditate, their intentions shift along a continuum, which I think makes sense for anyone who's practiced yoga or meditated that you start off with some really basic intentions and they become a little deeper and more profound as you go. But mm -hmm. the outcomes also shifted with the intentions. So I'll link to that paper for people who are curious to dive in there. And then there was another one that really took me down the rabbit hole of therapeutic intention and healing where they had people focusing on petri dishes of yeast and trying to make them grow or, or not grow and odd, odd research. But one thing that I pulled out of that was that people who were trained in focused attention, for example, experienced meditators had much better outcomes, whichever way, whether they were intending the yeast to grow or intending the yeast to fail, had much better outcomes than casual participants. So I'll link to that mind-blowing paper as well. And that really yeah. honed... Oh, the sorry. I, I yeah, want to speak to that paper because I want to, I don't know if they, if I, um, I didn't, I don't know if I read that paper or not. I read several papers prior. To yeah. This, we've been diving in. We have, but I, but I want to say that one thing, I don't know if they brought up the, the role of dopamine in that, but, um, I think so. One thing that is really interesting too, that I just want to bring up a lot of people think of our neurochemical dopamine as like our reward chemical, Mm -hmm. And and there is an aspect of that to dopamine. We do get excited. Like if somebody likes our Instagram post, we do get a little surge of dopamine for some of that more extrinsic sort of motivation. But what's really cool about dopamine is it's actually our tracking chemical. Hmm. So what it does is it orients us in a direction. So when we think about something like intention or purpose, and even along the lines of what you were talking about in terms of like um, consistency and like how that deepens over time, mm. what happens again, this is related to that intrinsic motivation or doing something for the sake of doing it. It's almost like it rewards ourself mm. because we're getting into like this more gratifying experience by repeating the practice. So and it's like little breadcrumbs does. basically. It keeps us oriented. Like a breadcrumb trail. I, I want to head in this direction. I did a thing. Oh, I got a little closer. And dopamine puts yes. a little breadcrumb. Oh, I did the thing again. Oh, I got a little closer yes. again. Right. Uh -huh. So it gives oh, this. Oh, I love uh -huh. when I get closer. <laughs> yeah. I think of my dog like Ooh. sniffing. <laughs> yes, a little trail of dog treats. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's the role of dopamine in, in terms of once we've set an intention and we have a direction that we want to head, dopamine kind of marks the pathway and keeps kind of magnetizing us back to the direction that we perceive as getting us closer to that rewarding outcome. Yeah. So it keeps us on track and then it's a little boost of feedback along the way when we mm. hit that, those little milestones. And so that's like one way to kind of capitalize on our neuroscience to uh -huh. help us get somewhere. So that's the kind of science behind that consistent practice, making us better. Every time we do it and we perceive ourselves as doing well, we get the little dog treat or the little breadcrumb and, and then we mm -hmm. do it again. And then we perceive ourselves doing well. And, oh, that's really interesting. I love that. Make sense yeah, of it. I think of your comment about the, like, to me, I'm thinking about the intense intentions shifting from like self-regulation to exploration, the mm. liberation, like mm. I'm almost feeling like somebody's 
tracking that experience with intention as well. Like they mm. get more out of it as they, as they like the intentions that. themselves shift and deepen as you get closer to the thing that you thought you wanted, you realize there's a whole nother layer of things that you think will be better. And then a whole nother layer again. Likely. Yeah. Mm. I think so. Yeah. So it's when spiritual you're... practice, maybe, or, or a contemplative practice. I know I feel that just in the physical practice, that as I get more curious about what I'm experiencing on the yoga mat, the things that felt important to me to begin with become less interesting. And I'm like, oh, but this new thing, this more interesting thing, this more subtle thing, that's now what's motivating. So I can really imagine how that would happen in a contemplative mental practice as well. Yeah. And do you bring that? Isn't that, is that ever part of your intention, like for your asana practice is maybe yeah. to explore those things? Definitely. I usually show up with a pretty simple intention, which is just, how do I feel? What do I need? Because, you know, in daily life, it's really easy to go a whole day without checking in to see how you feel, you know, busy, busy, busy little bees. And then I arrive on my mat. How do I feel? What do I need? And that's usually my starting intention. But often as the layers kind of peel back and I figure out how I'm feeling, my intentions also shift. I need to be a little more quiet. I'm feeling mentally very busy. I need to create a little bit of stillness. Mm. Uh, what about you? What's, what's your intention mm. when you show up on your yoga mat? I mean, sometimes I do. Um really get like something that I'm really, you know, anchoring into like, um, so, uh, I have the one course on yoga medicine on the yamas and the niyamas. And, you know, I spent a lot of time over my years of practice of picking one and centering on it for a period of time. And then working mm -hmm. on that through not only maybe intention and meditation, but in movement and theming breath and, you know, and, and other ways of walking through the world with it. Um, so I do love that as a practice of, of, of being like picking something, you know, that I want to This is cultivate. my compass. This is my yeah. compass and I'll, and I'll see where it takes me. Yeah. But I also really do resonate with this concept of what do I need mm -hmm. and, and like being a little bit more open. And, and I think I, I want to bring up something else that I think is neat about that approach is that like, right, we can set intention and we can have it be kind of like this more prefrontal cortex activity. But if we get into another mode of the brain, which sometimes gets a bad rap, which is called the default mode network, because it's it's our mind wandering. Mm -hmm. But the mind wandering is also a really great place for insight. So if we yes. train well, <laughs> if we don't go down the negative loop of, of default mode and we can learn how to get into like more of just the like, oh, that's a cool idea or whatever, maybe we can land on intention mm. by going there in our practice too. I love the fact that you brought that up because I know for me, whenever I need to do creative work. I can't think myself into a creative idea that doesn't come from the thinking part of my brain. I need to go out for a walk or, you know, do some housework or just kind of switch my brain off to, to default mode. And that's where the little insights bubble up. And if I can capture them and, you know, I usually just write them in my phone or write them on a piece of paper and then carry on all of those little insights bubble up. And I might not have had those if I'd gone in with this laser focus of, I need to come up with an idea for X think about an idea for X. Sometimes you need that space, don't you? You need it. And it's actually what we're learning again, in, in kind of understanding like how we can optimally engage with our human brain, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? What we're learning is like, it's necessary. It's like, so the release, we call it release. And so it's like getting out of, you know, the struggle phase of, mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever it is we're contending with mentally or this choice we're trying to make or the distraction we're trying to avoid, whatever it is. Right. And it's a matter of being able to like, kind of let the mind wander. Usually it ha happens during movement, like taking mm -hmm. a walk happens in the shower. You get your best ideas you know, in the shower. So something about some sort of stimulation, Andrew Huberman talks about forward ambulation, where there's just something about that. You can drive on an empty country road and mm -hmm. you start to mind wander. And it's, that is where I would say talking about intention 
if you want to really get like aligned with you, <laughs> then you would go there and see mm. what comes up and then, you know, maybe do some sort of meditation and see what comes up and then go from there. You've hit the nail on the head. I think we come up with this in every single conversation we have in yoga medicine is the middle path, the need for yeah. balance. Like if we stay in the default mode network, we have a tendency to ruminate, don't we? To kind of get ourselves into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller little circles. But if we are always in this sense of, I must control my thoughts, I must direct my thoughts. Now I'm only thinking about X. Now I'm only thinking about X. We're kind of fighting our own nature aren't we because the brain's not really meant to be under tight control all the time so the key is picking and choosing when when do i keep gently guiding my mind back to a single point of focus when do i let it wander and see what comes up what are your thoughts on how we can find that balance so my net my newest stuff that i'm really into is called um ultradian rhythms mm -hmm. and it's for every expression of stress and you know the good stress to focus is stress right working anything that you're in your frontal lobe is considered kind of sympathetic nervous system you mm -hmm. know response that we should have at least 20 minutes of break or rest. Yay. And I'm playing with that. I know I'm playing with it because look at every other animal on the planet. Mm -hmm. What do they do? Yeah. They rest. They rest a lot. Yeah. You see that with dogs, <laughs> don't you? They're, they're always ready when something interesting is happening because the entire rest of their lives, they're stretching, they're sleeping, they're eating, they're seeking out a nice little patch of sun they really do conserve their energy for when it's needed. Whereas we seem to expect ourselves to be on at all moments of every day. And then we expect ourselves to neatly switch off and sleep heavily all night and then switch back on and yeah. that sort of computer idea. Even yeah, computers don't exactly. work that well in that model, do they? Even computers need cleaning up and defragging. They need to and... sleep too sometimes, yeah. right? <laughs> totally. They function because... best when you shut them down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> So I love that you've been playing with giving yourself permission to be less efficient, less effective, let the brain have a little break, have a play. So funny thing that you say that, cause like, that's what the stereotype of that is, is like, if I'm not working eight hours straight, then I'm less efficient, less effective. Mm -hmm. But what the research shows is that people are more productive because what's happening is, is like they're getting into longer focus state into the psychological flow state of like optimal state of focus. So they're more productive in the smaller windows of time when they are focused. Mm. And then just like you mentioned, they're recharging the battery when they're not focused so that, that, so like a release, we, we talk about this concept of like struggle. And then the release is like, you know, that walk or that drive where you go into default mode, but you don't have to be there for hours. It's like yeah. 20 minutes. Mm. Then you get into like your focus and your flow. Then you need recovery, like mm. real recovery rest, you know, not a CrossFit workout. <laughs> so <laughs> like, if, if you don't have the capacity to kind of change your workday, if you can't schedule your own workday yeah. and you're on somebody else's schedule, can you think of any ways that you could build in those little breaks yeah. so that you go yeah go for it yeah so what 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 breath so mm -hmm. the breath the a breath practice is the quickest way to manage the nervous system and so plant the seed of intention around having your breath practices that serve you right mm -hmm. so when you feel like like and and you just want to think about when we talk about this in the mental health module you want to think about some breath practices rise you up a little, arouse you a little, right? And mm -hmm. so when, when you're feeling like, oh, I can't go on and I'm lacking motivation and, you know, that kind of thing, it's great to do something. And I would do it for like four or five minutes, you know, like really amp up that energy. Like Kapalabhati could be a great breath done slowly and controlled and it mm -hmm. could really get somebody like motivated again. Yeah. Whereas something like box breathing could be really great for like, if you're like spent at the end of the day, mm -hmm. or if you're like, um, gosh, I like, I've been working on this for 20 minutes and I really need to work on it for 20 more minutes, but I'm about to pick up my phone. You can kind of hack that by like getting into box breath. And usually that'll drive you to focus and get back into what you want to do. So you mm -hmm. can use breath intentionally 
to actually hack your mental state to hopefully then pair intention or goal with behavior action. I love that. I think that's really powerful and quick is the point, isn't it? Because, you know, I have the capacity to tweak my own schedule and, and factor in times of high productivity and then times of down regulation, but a lot of people don't. And just mm-hmm. to know that you could take three minutes, four minutes, five mm-hmm. minutes of mindful breath work and completely Mm -hmm. change your state. That's a powerful tool to have in your toolkit. That one. And the other one that is pretty good is the visual field stuff because it's Mm -hmm. so quick. So you could wall stare. um, You could do like oscillate between like focus and then looking, you know, distance horizon. Mm -hmm. And then you could stare horizon for like a minute or two. And that'll down regulate if you're feeling hyper aroused. Okay. So the sort of what we would talk about in yoga as having a sort of broad, soft gaze, not laser focus on the horizon, but just kind of taking in color, shape, that kind yeah, of concept. So if, so if you were in a room, like I would want to maybe look at, like, try to bring in everybody, like the visual field of looking at like panorama. Mm-hmm. If you were in a yoga class, if you wanted to up energy and like, if you were again, feeling like hypo aroused, sluggish, lack of motivation, you could focus, you could drishti. Mm-hmm. And so you could, or you could pick something to stare at as like an open eyed focus technique. That's great. And again, that's something you could do, even if it's hard to imagine, but some people must still have to work in offices with other people or workplaces with other yeah. people. That's something you can do fairly subtly yeah. that doesn't make you look like a crazy thing, but allows you to shift your internal state. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I it's, like that. It's, it's something you could do at your desk. So is there anything else about intention or purpose that you think we need to understand from the research that you've looked through? I think I've pulled out the couple that I felt the most excited about Yeah, or the most interested um, by. I'm just looking at. There was here. one about uh, movement where motivational goal priming with or without awareness. So even if people aren't aware of it, produces faster and stronger force exertion. So when we were talking about that intention to move or that intention to activate the body, priming people's, um, I guess not even their minds because some of it was subliminal. It was too fast for them to even read. Priming their awareness for things that were more highly motivating and energizing gave them a faster and stronger grip. I thought that one was really interesting. Small study, but worth people having a look at, I think, that motivation towards movement goals is powerful, but it it might not even require you being consciously aware of it. was crazy. Yeah. So that goes back to what we were talking about before, where it could possibly be a result of conditioning. And that's what's <laughs> interesting because we're so conditioned as humans. Mm. There's a lot of different models, but there the the idea there is that because the, if it's unconscious, the idea there is that that's been like an associated conditioned pattern that is mm. like about to too happen. quick, too quick for the conscious brain to even intervene. Exactly. In. It's it's faster than that. I think that's where it gets interesting and messy when we talk about intention and movement, because usually movement happens unless we're in a really mindful kind of slow flow practice or a walking meditation. We're not in the in the process of thinking. Okay, lift mm-hmm. right arm mm-hmm. gently, step right foot forward, it's happening faster than the conscious mind can process. And I guess that's where the research around movement takes us down this rabbit hole of do we have free will or or do we not? Whereas I think in the context, most of us think about intention, it's a little bit more cognitive. I have things that I want to achieve in my life, or I have values that I want to live up to in my life. These are the intentions that are kind of my compass as I move through my day there's more room for our conscious thought to intervene in those sorts of intentions, isn't there? I think so. And, and, and I think too, like if you looking at movement, I I definitely think that maybe the intention isn't there to like, you know, take a step forward, but maybe the intention is I'm walking to the counter to get a Mm. glass or, you know, like, like, so 
I do think it's hard to separate that. And then someone else might say, a different psychologist might say, well, there was an evolutionary drive because you were thirsty <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, then, so, and you had, you know, a fixed have, uh, action pattern that moved you toward, you know, that glass. So it can get really heady in terms of understanding it versus movement versus, um, you know, cognition, but mm. What I think is cool is um, if we even take it outside of research and then go back into like contemplative practice or philosophy, yeah. Yeah. is that it actually doesn't live in the head, it lives in the heart, right? Mm. So like the seat of consciousness, according to like the Tantra writings, is that the intent, all of it, it the consciousness lives in the heart. Mm. So it's a whole different, you know, now we're learning all these different things about the there's the a lot heart, of places where, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of places where Western science and research are yet to catch up with these indigenous traditions, the kind of wisdom that humans have cultivated over, you know, centuries of just experiencing and experimenting and the insights that they've come up to that way. And I think that's why I love this conversation in the context of yoga, because obviously this podcast isn't really about psychology or neuroscience. It's, it's about yoga and how yoga can help us in our lives. And I think that's something that really marks our yoga practice out as being different from daily life in that most of us have pretty clear intentions when it comes to our movement practice, our breathing practice, our mindfulness practice, we're thinking on purpose, we're breathing on purpose, we're moving on purpose. And that in itself is part of what makes yoga feel so different to the other things that we do. But whenever I think about intention in yoga, I come to a really central question. It was the, the very first thing we discussed in my yoga teacher training. What's the aim of yoga? So what's your opinion on the intention of the practice of yoga? I know it's a huge question. A big question. I mean, if I, I like to operationally define things, so <laughs> I, I do, it works for me to put it in a container. Right. Um, I mean, for me, I, the first thing I go to is it's the eight limbs. Like mm -hmm. I would just, you know, that's that, and that makes it a huge definition. It covers all my bases. Right. If I, if I say that, but, um, no, really. I mean, I, I think the, the simpler, the more I do this, the longer I do it, the simpler it gets. And mm -hmm. it's really about, to me, it's about being able to be at home in your home mm -hmm. <laughs> in this, in this thing, in this, and, and I don't know what this home is. I read about you know, I love the philosophy and I love the kosha model and I love, you know, exploring, you know, both the philosophy and some of the science um, mm. and some of the, even just some of the mythology, right. Mm. is fun to explore too, but I don't know. I think that's the mystery. And I think yeah. that's the cool thing is that not everything can be studied by science. <laughs> I think so too. And I love the fact that you went straight to philosophy and uh, we will link to it in the show notes for people who are interested in doing your course, the, the path inside the yoga sutras, the path to freedom. It's a really interesting way to kind of explore yoga philosophy in a way that makes it a little bit more directly related to your practice and the way that you move through your life. I think when the question came up in, in my teacher training right on day one, you know, the aim of yoga practice to my teachers was to, to find liberation, freedom from suffering and liberation. And to me then, and honestly, even to me now, that's a little bit too lofty a goal. I, I don't arrive on my mat. Well, I guess I do a little bit in terms of leaving suffering. How do I feel? What's going on for me? What do I need? What will make me able to move through my life with a little bit more care and thought, not just for myself, but for others. So maybe there's a little bit of that in there, a little bit of that intention to alleviate my own suffering so that I'm more aware of being able to help other people. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but it is a really lifelong exploration, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and I think kind of like that one research study that you brought up where the intention like evolves and, mm. and kind of shifts and peels away like an onion in a sense, like, I think that too. And, and I think that 
you know, over time, the practice brings us different things, Yeah, you know, and, and different things that we have to, like, I know for me, I think about when I went through a couple of years of like a pretty intense injury and like the intention there and the practice there and all of it, like, first I was like angry at my practice, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I was like, I was angry at everything. Cause I was like, God, I just, can't do what I think I'm supposed to be doing mm-hmm. on my yoga mat. And then the, it finally came, the only things that worked were meditation and a little bit of MFR, myofascial release. And other than that, that's what I had to, and breath. But other than that, I, I didn't have a lot of movement that felt good. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember at one point, my intention was to feel the parts of my body that didn't hurt. Didn't hurt. <laughs> I think you've you've really hit on something there in that there's a million different intentions that we could have for our practice. And going right back to where I started, we could be doing exactly the same things for different reasons. You know, you could be doing myofascial release, looking for the parts of you that don't hurt. And I could be doing myofascial release, trying to figure out why my right shoulder and left shoulder are different. And somebody else could be doing myofascial release to rehydrate the tissues after training and somebody else could be. So there's this, we could be doing exactly the same thing, but going into it, looking for a different outcome, going into it with a different purpose really does change our experience of that practice. And, and that changed experience of the practice then leads us to a a different next step perhaps, because we've got that different um, framework for our pattern recognition system. We're looking for different things, we see different things, and then that takes the trail of breadcrumbs down in a slightly different direction for each of us. Perfectly summed up. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's it's exactly what it is. And then, you know, we haven't even talked about emotions around it, like how Mm. you can tap into some of that. But I mean, there's, you know, we've been talking about it kind of heady and movement and whatnot, but then like tie in like where our emotional being fits into that because a lot of intentions, I'm I'm guessing at least a lot of mine have been our heart, like they have to do with something like compassion or Mm. peace or something that has like an emotional balance to it. So there's, there's that too, where like, if I'm practicing and I'm centering on something like compassion, like you mentioned, am I now a better yoga teacher? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of compassion. Am I a better, you know, family member? Am I a better citizen? Mm. Am I, you know, all of those things, um, and, and better or worse, isn't necessarily the goal, but that the idea is that like, again, like from my idea of it is like, I'm living better in this vessel in a way that like impacts, you know, my time on this planet. Mm. And it could be super simple, like feeling, or it could be compassion and Mm. not, not one is better than the other. You mentioned earlier on that we can make our intentions more powerful. We can kind of prime that pattern recognition system by, by bringing it into our physiology by kind of, so Mm -hmm. could you explain a little more about that? Because as you were talking about compassion, I was thinking about how that felt, how we can kind of recognize those more emotional things in a different way to concepts they yeah, feel so I am gonna. Body, I they? do want you to link to this study. There's mm-hmm. a, um, a study called Visualizing Compassion. It's a 2022 study, so it's new stuff. So, um, but Ooh. basically, um, the idea there is that when we get into deeper five sensual and emotional experiences with something that might start off as like a concept, right? Mm -hmm. Like a a word or a concept that we tend to prime it even stronger and likely engage, like the likelihood of engaging in the behaviors is higher than if we just mentally effort it alone. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think people feel that emotions, they grab us in a different way to thoughts, don't they? Well, the cool thing is, is not only does that recruit 
many different areas of the brain. So it, it creates a lot of activity, but it also, again, tunes into it. And again, I think we're at the very beginnings of this in terms of how we're like conceptualizing things, but it really speaks to the power of the nervous system below the neck. <laughs> because you have a very intelligent nervous system that's the same nervous system as the one above the neck. <laughs> but we constantly separate it. Yeah. <laughs> but so what it plays into is like if we can actually get into all of our nervous system, which would be part of that's the five senses, I'm assuming part of it's the fascia system, but we mm -hmm. don't have that part dialed in yet. But I bet if we can really start to integrate all of those different sensory sites and really start to command them in intentional embodied ways, mm. uh, we, I think that's the next frontier, uh, so but we we're ahead of ourselves. I think it's <laughs> a, several years out. So if we were kind of taking the juice out of that research in terms of its application for ourselves, what would that look like? Like if, if you did want to want to walk out into your day with yeah. enhanced compassion for yourselves and other people, yeah. what would that look like? Yeah. So I think it's similar. I mean, this is how I, this is how I work with it. And I offer it in the mental health module as, as one of our practices, but it's like, I call it visualize like the end, like visualize the end result, visualize the intention, but it's beyond that. It's like fully, I do it through meditation. So I sit and I immerse myself in every imaginable feeling of the culmination of the experience. So it, I try to feel it in my skin. I try to smell it, taste mm -hmm. it, see it, hear it. And then I try to run through ranges of emotions that just come to me through that default mode network of being in that, that kind of space. Um, so if it's something like compassion, maybe I'm even having minor little visualizations play out where I might be like helping people, or I might, you know, see myself in some way, like as the observer acting in compassionate ways, I might feel like a flutter in my heart. I might like feel tingling in my fingers or I might smile and feel joy, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Like getting into like as full of an immersive, immersive, like human experience of your end result. That makes sense to me because, you know, athletes are often at the, the cutting edge of this sort of stuff, aren't they? And they've yes. already discovered that if you can visualize yourself succeeding in whatever that athletic pursuit is you can feel it you can taste it you know what it smells like you know what your heart rate's going to be and what the sensations in the body will be you can make that much more likely to happen why would that not be true for other pursuits as well like compassion or healing or Everything. you know whatever the thing is that we want to focus on and I guess the research also suggests that then repetition would be key to have that really yes. vivid sensory experience and then to come back to it, whether it's your daily meditation practice or whether you also do it in your movement practice, but keeping setting up that breadcrumb trail so that you keep heading closer and closer to that direction. Mm. It's you're so on it. And you and I didn't, it's so funny. Cause like, we didn't talk about we didn't this, even plan ahead. this detail and you're on it. <laughs> so let me tell you what's so great about that. The last thing I'll say around that is, and I love that you brought up athletics because mm. the cool thing about athletics is 90% of the time they're training 10% of the time they're performing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. So think about your practices as your training, right? Whether that's yeah. intention, whether that's asana, breath, it's your training for when that 10% of the time you get out there, you pattern recognize you. So it actually is a, con it conserves your energy in a sense, because you're spending the time repeating, repeating, practicing, training, 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 visualizing. This is what it looks whatever, like. This maybe. is what it feels like. This is what the experience is. Remember this experience, recognize opportunities yes. for this experience. And then when you do, that's the little 10%. That's the cherry on top, the, the payoff. And then it's of automatic all of because it, you wired it. So it's now like the experience is the present moment. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's great. And that gives people, I think, some really clear takeaways from... I do suggest everyone dives into the research because it takes you down big rabbit holes, every aspect of intention, even how do you research something as intangible as 
what were people thinking? You know, what were people aiming for when X, Y, Z? So it's worth diving into the research, but I think even more important to come back to what does that mean to me in my life? How can I mm-hmm. apply that in my life? And I think we're coming up with some nice, simple takeaways, which is one to to to, to cultivate some clarity around what you are looking for, what your purpose is in your life and your relationships. And some of that can be that focused prefrontal cortex, but some of that just bubbles up instinctively in the default mode network. So you've got to create that quiet space, that sort of relaxed or or easygoing space for those insights to come to the surface. I call it receptive um, because like, you know, we're doing a lot, right? So those spaces of like just being, and re- receptive to life and not having to effort. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that balance between cognitive thought and that receptive state where you're just allowing insights to arise can really help us figure out what our purpose should be or what our intentions are. And then to create a really vivid experience of them an imagined experience of what it looks like, what it feels like, what it tastes like, the sensations in the skin, the feeling in your body, and the more vivid you can make that, the better your brain then gets at pattern recognition, the more it's able to recognize opportunities for that in the world. And then repeat, 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 90% practice, 10% performance, Mm -hmm. get your system primed and ready by coming back to that over and over again. Right. Practice yeah. and all is coming. Yeah. Well, it's true, isn't it? Well, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, it's simple. It's, it's, mm. but it, it, life isn't, doesn't always feel, it doesn't feel that clean cut. Um, there's a lot <laughs> going on, right? 100%. And I do think it's important to come back to the fact that intention alone is not enough. Like, even if you have, Uh, the intention of healing, sometimes you don't heal. You know, the body is complicated. We're also subject to the external environment. And even if your intentions are pure in your relationship with relationships with people, sometimes you still hurt people's feelings and the outcome is just as important Mm -hmm. as your intention was. So intention alone is not enough. I -hmm. guess this is where I would like to leave people, but the brain is incredibly powerful as is, as you said, the rest of the nervous system below the neck. So if we can harness that power, why would we not? Why would we not at least gather what benefits we can, knowing that life has some element of chaos to it? We may not achieve our intentions, but it can't hurt to start out in that direction. Mm. I love that. I would add, and this is what you do, and this is what we do at Yoga Medicine, is maybe explore using questions and curiosity to form intention. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to starting with, I want to be X or I want to do X. What actually is important to me? And I think sometimes our values surprise us. Sometimes when you really dive into asking yourself what's important to you, it might not be what you thought it was. (laughs) That's how I teach intention. It starts with like this inventory of like, where do I feel aligned and where, and how am I sp- really spending my time? Mm, Cause that's <laughs> the key, isn't it? Is your, your actions are telling you all the time where you spend your time and attention, your actions are telling you what you value. And if that doesn't mm-hmm. meet with what you think you value in your mind, you, you need to create a conversation. There is, do my actions need to change or does my perception of my intention need to change? Mm -hmm. Am I maybe valuing different things to the things that I thought? And, you know, you hear people find that all the time when they've gone down their career path, thinking it would make them happy to have this sense of achievement in the external world. And they get it and go, oh, I don't feel any better. Maybe I don't value what I thought I valued. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave people with? Any other thoughts for them to chew on when they're out for a walk and their default mode network is is bubbling away? I have a tip we use um, in my work as a performance coach to get the default mode network going. So Mm -hmm. let's say you're like, ah, my brain's packed and I want to do that. We call it the MacGyver method. And it's like, um, you know how MacGyver can like figure anything out. Yeah. So give him some bubble gum. 
if you're, yeah, exactly. The idea is like, if you write down like something that you're struggling with or that you have a question about and you're like, oh, I can't figure this out. You write it down you write down whatever you want about it. You get it out of your head and mm-hmm. then you go do your activity, like a walk or do a yoga practice. Or something. Yeah. Something that kind of takes you. And they say that likely because you got the question out and you took that moment that um, not, they say like, we actually, again, it's a, it's a strategy that works. We know that people are likely within like, you know, a short time frame are likely to come up with the answer because they, they come spark down to it with recognition again. Yeah. You've, you've clarified to the brain, to the filter. Yeah. This is what you're looking for. This is what you're yeah. looking for. And then you put it to one side, go about your day and the, the brain's working away in the background, filtering all of the information that comes in, looking for that thing. I love that. Yeah. That's and you're letting really great- it, you, Yeah. And you got to let it go. That's the point. It's like, that's the thing. I think the biggest thing I see is people try too hard to like, like rack their brain, you know, like those types of even phrases, like I'm going to rack my brain, you know? And it's like, no, it's actually like letting it go. So think about MacGyver is locked up in a prison somewhere in Thailand inside your brain. You're off doing your thing. MacGyver's playing around with a bubble gum and a piece of tin foil. And (laughs) well, he'll come up with the answer just in time for the episode to end. (laughs) Exactly. You can, you can be MacGyver too. (laughs) (laughs) That's definitely going to be our takeout for social media. You can be MacGyver too, people. I love that. Thank you very much, Diane. I think that gives listeners some, some interesting things to ponder and to dive into, but also some really clear takeaways to play with in their own lives. And and I agree with you. I think most of us, especially in in this population, we're trying too hard. And if Mm -hmm. we can just give ourselves that little bit of space to play that little bit of room to breathe, then Mm. we might get ourselves a little closer to our intentions in life. Mm. Well, thank you. It's always such a stimulating conversation. I appreciate being a guest. Same. Thank you so much for your time, Diane. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you liked the show, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com. Check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine, or you can email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being part of our Yoga Medicine community. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.